Hello friends, welcome to the Jazz Ranch. You can pretend I'm George Sheary tonight. I'm going to be playing a George Gershwin song called Lady Be Good. And I'm going to be talking about playing your left hand comping against the melody. How to do that. And also I'm going to be talking about how to play outside the scale. And I'm using a new technique with two cameras. So I hope you enjoy this. Please let me know how this works out. It's an experiment for me, so bear with me. But here we go now with Gershwin's Lady Be Good with a backing track. Here we go. Starting out, I want to look at my book here, chapter 21 of volume 2, called Rhythmic Comping with the Left Hand. Now, people ask me about this a lot. How do I comp with my left hand? Or how do I comp in general, you know? Well, the comping in, in the left hand often contrasts with the right hand rhythm. And also, it can complement, and it, it can sync up. But what you want to get is a good swinging groove feel, you know? So you want to practice this with a metronome or with the rhythm section you know, maybe a backing track to start with, but you want to get a good rhythm. Now, I have this written out for you, the rhythm that I played. Like that, the first four measures. I, I wrote this, the whole song out with the left hand comp so you can read it off the chart here. But also, I've written, I've talked about the theory of it. In other words, what's actually going on is that you have long tones, in other words, the chord can be long or can be short, like that. Now, it can be on the beat or it can be off the beat or on the upbeat. So it can be on the downbeat, like one, two, three, four, or it can be on the offbeat or the upbeat, one and two, three, like that. Now, same thing with short notes. You can have short notes that are on the downbeat or on the upbeat, one and two that so now what you generally do is you mix it up so you have some short some long some on the beat some off the beat so that combination makes for an interesting mix and it also makes it swing better than if you just well let me say this um, when I first heard Bill Evans play on the portrait album he did something that was unique I hadn't heard other pianists do this he was actually comping the rhythm of his right hand on his solo, like he might have done like something like this. In other 
afterwards, you see how that left hand was really complimenting as opposed to contrasting like. See, that's off the beat. Now, when I heard Ahmed Jamal, I noticed that he was playing off the beat, like one, two, three, four, and, 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 you see? So like he's playing like uh, one, two, three, four, like one, two, three, four. So he was swinging with the rhythm section, which is laying the beat down, but he was putting that offbeat in there against the melody and it really made it swing even harder. So that's a beautiful thing that he did. So that's the important thing is to get the two hands in sync. Now I have to practice this, you know, with that theory in mind and practice the score um, slowly, you know. And with a metronome, you have to practice and get it really to be right in the groove, right on the beat. In other words, with the swinging feeling. So, um, so there you go for the comping in the left hand. I want to talk a little bit about the outside playing, meaning um, where I'm playing not on the scale of the chord that I'm, you know. So the first chord is G. If I play outside of it, it sounds like this. It doesn't sound right. Okay, so you have to be clever how you do this. And it's not arbitrary, but it's thought out. But it is arbitrary, yes. Yeah. So there's times when it will be arbitrary, you're just, you know, you're on the top of your head. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about it. Now, there are some things you can do to enhance this technique um, in which they're thought out ahead of time. And what, one of them is to alter the chord as it falls in such a way that it may be a half step higher or a half step lower. So you're voicing it, you know, like for instance, let's do G to C7, to G to E7. Now the next chord would be A minor. Now what if I went, instead of A minor, what if I went to B flat minor? I would take it up a half step. Now I'd play that scale. Now it would sound, you know, like, like out. Maybe I'd resolve it. You see, I get to the A, A minor 7 on that end of that measure, but it would be late. And in the meantime, I had something that sounded more interesting. You see, you can't be afraid to play notes that aren't in the scale because we are so trained to do that as a rule of thumb that we have to play something that sounds correct, you know, melodically. Well, you know, we found out like, you know, that when we first heard this sort of thing, it didn't sound right to our ears and we didn't like it, what Monk was doing or what Coltrane was doing. But then we began to like it as we got used to that sort of that dissonance. You know, we got used to the dissonances and the things that were off sounding and they became more interesting to us than just hearing the same old, you know, let's play on the chord every time correctly, only the notes that are in that chord sort of things. So the other thing that I did was, um, let's see, I did, uh, you know, sometimes instead of starting on the G, I'd start on an A flat, you know, like. And the other thing I did was uh, on the 3, 6, 2, 5, I'm on, on the uh, B minor to E7, I would change and play the tritone substitute. Now that's a really important way to, pl to sound like you're playing notes that are out of the scale. You know, because see, here's the B minor 7, here's the E7. Well, if I play a B flat there, the tritone substitute, now, now I have a completely different sound. It's like... See, and I'm just playing a B flat scale there. But instead of an E scale, you know, I'm playing a B flat scale, the tritone substitute. Same thing here now in the A minor, the 2-5. With the D7 now, I'm going to be playing... It's tritone, well no, I'm going to actually voice it in such a way that I have a B flat chord on the top. Now this is one of those things I call superimposed chords. Now this is, really works well for playing some unique lines that are not on the scale, or not in the chord that you're thinking of. In other words, I'm playing a D7 in the left hand, but I'm playing a B flat chord in the right hand. Now that what that creates is a sharp 9 on the D7, sharp 9, and then a sharp 11 and then a 13. So now I can play this. I can do it 
right here. This would be, this one would be like the C sharp. You see, so that's pretty easy to do. I just play the D7, now play a B flat scale. Okay. You might want to lower that one. Now the other thing I did was I used this scale, which is a Locrian scale. Actually, I'm sorry, Lydian scale. This is a G flat Lydian. Now that means it's the fifth or the fourth step of a D flat scale, D flat major. Five flats. So now, but I'm starting on G flat, so I'm going like this. So the G flat scale would normally have a C flat in it. Now it has a C natural. Now that works beautifully against the D7. What an interesting sound it is. Because you're emphasizing all those upper structures. You see, when you do the superimposed chords, like that one, but you play on the scale of the upper chord, now, now you're really getting some interesting sounds. Signing off, I just wanted to make this video short because we're leaving for Europe in a few days and I wanted to give you something to remember me by in case our plane crashes and we don't make it back. But anyway, write to me. I always try to respond. You'll see that if you read my comments, you'll see that I always try to respond and I'd love to hear from you. And I will continue more with this subject on the next time around. Until next time, I will say in the words of my great friend, Hermie Dressel, swing loose, be cool. And we'll see you when we get back home, hopefully. Bye-bye.